And put simply, the metallurgist's job is to release the ore from the rock by breaking the bonds between the ore and the rock, the mechanical bonds, and by melting the rock and the ore. Smelting is an old process. It was already used two or three thousand years ago. It can be illustrated in this crucible. The melting of the ore and the rock causes the rock to float to the surface and the heavy sulfide to sink to the bottom. It's a continuation of the same kind of process by which the ore originated during the cooling of the igneous rock. The first task in producing pure metal from the ore is to break the mechanical bonds between the sulfide grains and the silicate grains. This is accomplished in the crushing and the grinding process. This breaks the mechanical bonds. It's now done in quite sophisticated equipment. And the ore is broken down to a constant and controlled size, eventually down to about one hundredth of an inch. This is accomplished in mills, rotating drums containing steel bars or balls. In this way, the silicate crystal grains and the ore, the sulfide crystal grains, are released from one another. And therefore, it becomes possible to separate the rock, which one doesn't want, from the sulfide, which one does. Here, the rods are tumbling inside one of the grinding mills. The ore then looks like a pulp, the ground up ore and rock. And it can be separated. And constant analysis of the separation can go on, controlled by computer, at the same time as the remaining material is going through the smelting and the separating process. The control rooms of a, a modern mine look rather different from the headquarters of mines not so very long ago. Here, the waste product being poured away. The slag that's such a familiar sight to tourists and to the residents of Sudbury. And these are the rocks of the Sudbury Basin. The ore, the very rich sulfide ore, and the rocks of the igneous rim, the pink micropegmatite, and the rather darker norite, and then the Chelmsford sandstone, the rather dirty sandstone, which fills the center of the basin and which we don't find anywhere else. Now, those are relatively easy rocks to explain, although the ore is obviously very rich. It's quite commonly associated with igneous rocks, such as we find in the basin. But the really peculiar rock is the one that's found at Onaping Falls, the Onaping Breccia, which is formed of fragments of rock. You can see one or two lighter patches on this specimen. It's that Onaping Breccia which brought the astronauts to Sudbury, and which gives us some clues as to the origin of the basin. You may, may remember from Unit 14 that we compared the Sudbury Basin to a meteorite impact crater, and it was that rock, the Onaping Breccia, which brought the astronauts to Sudbury to look at it as perhaps evidence for that meteorite impact origin of the basin. If the basin is a meteorite impact crater, then the story probably runs like this. About two billion years ago, the impact of a large meteorite, perhaps several kilometers across. After the impact, immediately after the impact, a great deal of material thrown out, which fell back into the crater as a layer of broken fragments, the onoping breccia. And beneath the crater, melting took place, molten rock welled up into the bottom of the crater like a pool and floated up those fragments. This is the igneous rock that now forms the rim. Then the next stage, the filling of the crater with this upper layer here, the green layer, 
the Chelmsford sandstone, and of course the erosion of the crater walls. And then finally, the crumpling of the originally round crater, or the squeezing of it, to give it its present elliptical form. That's one suggested series of events for the origin of the basin, beginning with the impact of a meteorite. Now there's another possibility too, that same Onoping breccia can be interpreted not as the fallback breccia of a meteorite impact, but as volcanic material. And in that case, the sequence of events would run like this. A volcano in the Sudbury area about two billion years ago, and we know there were volcanoes in this area at about that time. During a very violent explosion, after the volcano had been stoppered up, as it were, by the solidification of lava in its neck for some time, during a very violent explosion, the volcano was broken up into fragments, which sank back into the molten material beneath the crater. Here, the fragments sinking into that molten material, and the fragments of the Onoping breccia accumulating in the crater, and then the disruption of the shape of the crater, and also, not shown on this diagram here, the accumulation of the sand and mud that would now be the Chelmsford sandstone in the center of that crater. Two alternatives, both of them the product of a very violent event. And we're pretty certain that there was a violent event that caused the origin of the basin, and the grounds for that lie in evidence that the rocks in the Sudbury area have suffered from shock. In order to find that evidence, we must look outside the basin, beyond the ore zone exposed in the railroad, to the rock that was in place before the Sudbury Basin was formed and before the ore zone originated. These are such rocks to the south of the basin, and in them we find strange structures called shatter cones. Cone-shaped fractures within the rock, here about two feet tall, produced, so far as we know, only by very violent explosions, such as nuclear explosions, and perhaps by meteorite impacts. As well as the shatter cones, we also find what are called fissure breccias, and they're well exposed on the road north of Levac, north of the basin. Such a small fissure breccia is here with a dark ground mass and light fragments, the fragments being derived from the edge of the fissure. It seems as though the ground was broken up and boulders of granite in the north of the basin where the country rock is granite fell into the fracture and were ground up together to produce a rock flower ground mass, which is rather glassy and therefore dark. The fissure breccia formed by the pulsing jaw crusher action of the broken up ground during the explosion doesn't really tell us whether the basin was produced by a meteorite impact or by a volcanic explosion. It's simply not diagnostic enough. Even the shadow cones, which were once thought to be diagnostic of meteorite impact or nuclear explosion, are no longer thought to be as convincing. The best evidence probably does lie under the microscope. The fractures in this quartz crystal, shown as lines, are probably the best indication of very high shock pressures. But even that's not as certain as it once was. Whatever the origin of the basin, and it must remain at the moment enigmatic, the value of its ore and the richness of the metal deposits in Sudbury is not in any doubt at all. Last week we looked at some film of the early mining methods. Let's end by looking at the way that the ore was smelted at the beginning of this century. In a typical